the angle on this that is relevant to financial markets and investing is that the vaccines are not looking like the, the key to unlocking economies from these lockdowns. We've seen that in a few countries. The one I'm thinking of right now is Iceland, where one of the, the chief epidemiologists has said we might be stuck with lockdowns for, I think he said, 10, 15 or even 20 years because the vaccines, which are at a very high rate of vaccination in Iceland, are not stopping these infections, these cases, as they're called, without much of a definition for what a case is. So right. for Australia, uh, the, the story has been that, that we have, don't have enough vaccines, so the vaccination rate's too slow. But our point, or at least my point, would be that that doesn't necessarily mean that once the vaccination rates are higher, we're going to be able to you know, return to, to the new normal. Do you think there's going to be a divide between the different types of countries where they've, they've made a, a, a pitch towards zero COVID and it's not going to work versus the countries that have had the virus, whatever that means, like the UK, where the cases now are falling despite the fact that Freedom Day is about a week and a half in the past? Yes, I think there'll be divisions uh, between countries that are pursuing different policies. And you mentioned a few uh, of the extreme cases. Iceland, I put New Zealand in the same category. Um, maybe Australia, based on what we're seeing, versus other countries that, such as the UK that have had a tough time of it, but have seemed to take a live and let live attitude. So there'll be divisions among the countries. And then within the countries, there'll be divisions between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. Now, there's a very large group that no one talks about that I think is critically important. There is a group, uh, a large group in the United States, it's uh, 33 million people or 10% of the population who had COVID and recovered. Well, they have better antibodies than people with the vaccines. Um, they have the natural antibodies that they won't expect. Um, and they, those seem to be much more long lasting than the vaccine produced uh, responses, uh, uh, chem uh, you know, molecular responses. So um, what about them? They're technically unvaccinated, that's true, but they have better antibodies than those who have the vaccination. So even if you want to distinguish between vaccinated and unvaccinated, I think there's a lot of problems with that. In the unvaccinated group, what about the, the 33 million recovered uh, individuals who had COVID and have the antibodies? Shouldn't they at least be put in a different category? You're not hearing that at all in the United States. It's not discussed. It's as if they don't exist. It's as if there's a, a you know a crusade for 100% vaccination and children. Children shouldn't get the should, children should not get the vaccine. The side effects are it's not, it's not even close. The side effects in children are far worse than the disease, which they rarely get. Don't spread. Um, and uh, and and this has all happened in about a year and a half. Uh, you know, usually some of these drug trials normally go on for two, three, five years or, or longer. Um, we don't know what the side effects of these are, are going to be, although some of them are starting to appear now that the vaccines have been around for six months or, or even longer. Um, uh, again, we, we referred earlier to the fact that uh, they call this, they, they call the new infections of the vaccinated. So the vaccinated are getting sick and they call it a breakthrough infection. Well, just call it an infection. You know, spare me your euphemisms. Uh, you got the vaccine, you got infected, you're sick. That's happening. Don't blame the unvaccinated. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so yes, I think there'll be division, division among countries. By the way, in the, the, the COVID pandemic is the third worst pandemic in the last 650 years measured by fatalities. Number one was the Spanish flu, 1918, 1919. Number two was the black death of the uh, 1350s in the mid 14th century. And number three is COVID. Um, COVID is at, we're up to about 4 million deaths worldwide. The next closest pandemic, the number of fatalities was about 200,000. That was the Asian flu in, in 1958. So yeah, it's serious. I mean, uh, a, a lot of deaths, a lot of cases, but we have to remember, you know, everyone's shouting, you know, the cases are up, the cases are up, they are. The fatalities are not up. Fatalities have kind of plateaued for the reasons we mentioned, better treatment and, and better clinical experience, et cetera. So let's not equate a case of COVID with a death. And, and politicians are doing that. They say, if you don't get this vaccine, you're gonna die. Well, actually you're not gonna die. You might get COVID and people with the vaccine might get COVID. We, we're now learning that. Uh, but if you do, you have, depending on your age group and comorbidities and other factors, you have a 99 point, you know, 0.8 or you know, 0.2, or you know, again, depending on your age, uh, chance of survival. Uh, and in younger people without 
um, you know, asthma or diabetes or uh, obesity, or other when I say younger, you know, even people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, you know, have a very, very low mortality rate from this. So, you know, every death is, is one too many, uh, and there's, a, there's a, enough tragedy to go around. But just because the caseload is going up, it doesn't mean the um, fatalities are going up. They're not. Uh, but one thing that is going up is immunity. If you have it and you don't die, and that's 99 plus percent of the people, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and so that's when that gets when that factor gets big enough, it's called herd immunity. Um, it does seem that the UK is sort of moving towards something like herd immunity. Again, I'm not anti-vax. If you want to get the vaccination, you know, be my guest. I would just sound all these cautionary notes about what it really is, how it really works, and whether it lasts. But if you want it, that's fine. It's readily available. Um, but um, but the greatest source of um, resistance to the disease will be survivors. Uh, there's a, there's the the, the the main model used in epidemiology to forecast and track the course of a pandemic is called the uh, the SEIR model. It's a um, you know, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. So let's, let's not forget about the art. And some people do die. I mean, I'm not I'm not making light of that, but basically getting it and surviving it, which is the the, the most likely result, is how a society gets past a, a pandemic. To me, the interesting side of this is that there's this trade-off between uh, you know, the vaccine versus getting COVID, you know, the side effects and all this sort of thing. The reason people with extremely low chances of having trouble with COVID get the vaccine is to protect others. But if you're still going to get cases in the vaccinated and they're still going to pass on uh, the virus, then why are these people where the risk of COVID is extremely low getting vaccinated? That, that benefit for, to society, to the people who are vulnerable, is no longer there. But let's move on to a particular issue that all Australians love to talk about, you call it double trouble when it comes to China and the virus and lockdowns. What about bubble trouble, housing bubble trouble? Do you think Australian house prices are finally going to take a hit at some point during this pandemic? Well, um, we're, we're seeing a, a, a boom in housing prices in Australia, no doubt about it. We see, we're seeing the same thing in the United States and, and Canada and some other countries. So it's a, it's a bit of a global phenomenon. I, I think this is one that's different than past bubbles, and I would just kind of reserve judgment on the, the bubble aspect of it in the following sense. You know, the old cliche in real estate, it's, you know, location, 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 you gotta get the right location. And that's true, that, that's always been true. But what we're seeing is um, uh, a kind of exodus from urban centers moving out into either suburban areas or what, what are sometimes called exurban areas, that's the next ring past the suburbs or even out into the country. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm up here in uh, New England in the United States. We've seen people in uh, uh, New York buying, you know, very attractive homes uh, in, in, in places like New Hampshire and Vermont. So I've seen them. We go to the website, take the, the, the virtual tour, call the broker, put it in the bid, and then kind of get up and drive up and look at the house they just bought. But, um, but that's going on. You can't get any home improvement done. Carpenters, electricians, um, plumbers, masons, painters, they're, they're booked a year in advance. They won't even take your book. It's not like, you know, call me next year and we'll see what we can do, but but I, I can't take any new clients. You know, supply shortages. So that's how bad it is. And again, we're seeing the same thing in Australia. But, but if that's driven by people leaving cities and going to suburbs and, you know, okay, the house prices go up and all that, is that really good for the economy? Um, cities are the greatest wealth generators in the history of civilization. That's where, where civilization comes from, 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 from the cities. Um, and, uh, you know, you get con dense concentrations of, uh, you know, talent, finance, uh, artistic talent, performing arts, writers, bankers, lawyers, accountants, uh, uh, and, and just everyday jobs and, and to support that entire network. Well, if you start ripping that out, and it starts with the, you know, maybe the, the, the more elite occupations, you know, a lawyer, accountant, bank or whatever, they can work from home. Okay, all of a sudden home is, you know, in our case in Miami, Florida, maybe where you are, it's on the Gold Coast or Perth or someplace, but home is not where it used to be. Uh, but what about the support network, the, the transportation, the, the cleaning staff in the building, um, the food trucks, the restaurants, the bars, uh, that all drops by 50% or more if people aren't going to the offices. So you begin to have a 
major economic drag. Now, does that bid up the price of housing in some of these more distant locations? No doubt about it. And some of that's real because there's a real uh, preference for, as I say, getting out of the cities. So, so yeah, you've got a boom. With a boom, there's always a risk of a bubble. I would watch it carefully, but I would not, I would say at least part of it, maybe even a lot of it is real in the sense of it's being driven, driven by real demand uh, to, to get out of cities. And then the other factor in Australia is uh, a lot of your real estate that was in cities prior to COVID was driven by Chinese demand. Um, you know, the, uh, the the joke last time I was in Melbourne was, you know, the national bird was the crane because there were so many cranes on the horizon putting up new high rises. Um, but uh, but that is cooling off a lot because of, uh, um, you know, capital controls in China and, uh, you know, this the whole standoff, diplomatic and trade standoff between China and Australia. So putting all that together, uh, is there a housing boom? Yes, um, but uh, it's selective in the sense that there's certain kind of go-to destinations that are booming, but I'm not sure that's as true in the city centers. Uh, and that exodus from the cities can be a bit of an economic drag uh, in terms of consumption and other, uh, other output factors. Thank you.